history that comes on the, the screen following it, I hope that that represents to you that Jesus is the light of the world and when we connect to Jesus, that is our source of strength, our source of power, and our source of hope. And then we need to pass that on. Jesus wants us to share. There's a, a poem that I probably should have brought up with me and read the whole thing, but I, I bet many of you have heard it. It's a poem that is about kindergarten. Almost everything important in life that I ever learned, I learned when I was in kindergarten. Remember that one? I, I learned uh, to share my toys and to put them away when I was finished. I learned to ask for permission to do things. I didn't just do it without assuming. I learned that if I hurt somebody, I should say the words, I'm sorry. In the sandbox, in the playground, that's where a lot of our life values are formed and they stay with us really for a lifetime. Many of the things that, that you need to know to be a functioning, um, successful adult, you learned in kindergarten. And, it, and that really is true. And so this phrase here is sort of a, a kindergarten phrase Jesus wants us to share. Um, you know, the reason I'm, I'm doing that is because it, it ties in specifically with what our church vision statement is. Um, I, I like little phrases and things like that that stick with you. I, when I was a kid, something that was said to me, just it blurted out of my mouth this morning. We were hurrying around getting dressed, trying to, to get to church on time, and we were just racing around. And I haven't said this or heard this in decades. Isn't it funny how something, it, it can just be in there. And from my childhood, I said out loud, hurry up, little Kiko, hurry up. See, my, my nickname growing up, I was Kiko Kid. That was my name. And, and I, I had my parents, hurry up, little Kiko. And out of nowhere, something that I learned that was said to me when I was just this high, just comes right out into my thinking, and I, I spoke it out. Um, Stephanie had all kinds of wonderful tricks. When the boys were little, she would uh, use all kinds of little catchphrases and little ideas to help them uh, behave. Uh, for instance, one time I remember that uh, we had we had at our dinner table said, and uh, Stephanie wanted the boys to have better manners because, I mean, let's face it, guys sometimes we don't have the best manners at the at the table, <coughs> and so. She devised this system, and it was just brilliant. She took 10 M&Ms, put it right on the table in front of each plate. And she told us, boys, when the meal's over, you get to eat those M&Ms, but you can't eat them until you finish your plate. And she didn't say another word. And so we started enjoying the meal, and if, if one of the boys forgot to say, please, she'd just reach over, grab an M&M, not say a word, put it over at her plate. If somebody didn't say thank you, she'd just take an M&M. And uh, I want to tell you something. Finally, after a number of meals of of myself not having any M&Ms left, I decided, you know, I think we need to learn better manners. But you, and, and that was just an awesome way for our kids to learn. Um, there's another thing she did with the kids when they were little and they were getting dressed. She would say, okay, it's time to get your shirt on, raise your hands. And I don't even know how this happened, but every morning I would watch this, it's just so cute. Raise your hands. They'd go, praise Jesus. She taught them that as just a, a little child. And that's how they put their shirt on every morning. Um, this, this phrase, Jesus wants us to share, came out of our personal family. I remember Stephanie telling the kids, Jesus wants us to share. Find purpose in Christ and share. If you want to narrow it down and boil it down to what Buckeye First Assembly is all about, that's it. 
After a year of praying and studying and talking back and forth and writing different things and, and being challenged to think in so many different areas, our leadership team came up with this phrase. And I want you to get used to this phrase. You will hear it often. This is how our church will behave for the many months ahead. Find purpose in Christ and share. Find purpose in Christ and share. Um, I think most of us know Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, but I wonder how many of us know verse 14. Philippians 4.13 is the one that you've memorized it probably in your childhood. Um, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Or as the NIV words it, I, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And uh, okay, Sharon, I apologize for the typo. I should have sent it to you. She saw it already. <laughs> It's driving her crazy right now. By the way, it's really good to have Pete and Sharon's good friends with us and uh, welcome them with a, a hand clap. We're so glad that you guys are with us today. God bless you. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Or like I said, NIV says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. But the next verse, yet it was good of you to share when I was in trouble. See, that famous verse is housed in a context in which Paul was going through an extremely difficult time. Um, he was facing difficulties and battles, and he had learned to be content no matter what he went through, because the secret to being content is not having money, not having necessarily freedom and privileges and rights, but the secret to success is to be content in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he had learned that, and yet he was depending upon the kindness and the generosity of the people from Philippi. They gave him a love gift on more than one occasion that helped him be able to be the apostle traveling around doing ministry. And so he says, yes, I can do all of this through him who gives me the strength. Yet it was good of you to share when I was in trouble. It was good of you to share. So we want to find our purpose in Christ and share. See, there are people just like the Apostle Paul all around us who are really in need and they need us to share what we have. Share our resources, share our talents, share our abilities. This pink sign right here, that's the international symbol for share. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, pink. It can be blue or sometimes it's white with different colors of trim. Sometimes they curve it, you, but you've seen this before. If you've ever used any social media at all, you've seen the share symbol. If you want to share a post, if you want to share a comment, you click share. We celebrate conversations at Buckeye First Assembly. We celebrate them. That's like sharing. See, if you were to... Uh, take out an investment fund, you might choose to find a really good company, one that, that is excellent in their track record of history. You might purchase shares in, in that operation and get a great return on your money. That would be good, solid investing. You and I have the opportunity to purchase shares for Buckeye First Assembly. And I'm not talking about spending money. I'm talking about every time you tell someone of the love of Jesus, you have just purchased an eternal share. And every time you send a text of encouraging words to someone, whether they're a Christian or not, you can make it. Your strength is in the Lord. I'm praying for you. You have purchased an eternal share. You are sharing, and that is our purpose. Now, on the screen, I want you to look at this graphic. It shows the five important uh, teaching points of our church. These are the five most important and intrinsic values that we have. This is the way we practice as a church. 
I'm going to say a lot more about this next week. Next Sunday when you come, we're going to have what we call a share expo. There's going to be things out in the lobby where you'll get to see opportunities where you can be involved in the different ministries, job descriptions and things like that to show where the needs are. And we're asking people to step up and help all of our leaders in the different ministry. There's a place for you. And so next week also in my teaching time, I'm going to be talking quite a bit about this graph and expanding on it more. And then two weeks from today, every person in the room is going to get a printed, handed out vision statement that you can take with you so that you understand every part of the plan. The plan from people looking on a website to find Buckeye versus Sibley or searching and finding the Facebook page. Because more than 80% of the people who come to church now, that's the first place they go. Did you realize that more than 80%, far more than the phone book, far more than the newspaper, the website and the uh, internet presence. So we hope that from the moment they search for our, our church, and then what's going to happen when they drive in the parking lot? Who's going to be there to meet them? What about when they walk up to this new church building and they've never been inside and, and they're coming up to the front door? Who will be the one to meet them and give them a warm greeting? And who will receive their children as they come in the lobby and, and say, here, I can check you in. and We have a safe and secure way to take care of your children. And Mom, here's your number. And kids, you get this sticker and you can go to your class. And if you need to be contacted, we know how to get in touch with you. And then they come, all of that, by the way, all that before they ever hear a song or a sermon. And it says a, a lot. And so we, folks, then we hope for people to come in and find a relationship with Christ. That, that's our ultimate goal. And, but we don't want to leave them like babies on the doorstep once they do invite Jesus into their heart. Do you know we, we have invested in a ministry called Equip. And Equip has right now 31 individuals signed up for our classes for this quarter. If you are not part of one of the equipped classes, I encourage you, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday, we're starting a brand new quarter. And you can come. Uh, some of the classes are on Wednesdays. At least this, this past quarter, some of the classes were on Saturday morning. We would love for you to be part of it if you haven't experienced it yet. But we want people to funnel into our church and find their purpose in Christ we want them to become grounded and grow and serve the Lord Jesus and, and even come to understand what their spiritual gifting is and then be released into ministry to use those gifts. But worship, serve, grow, connect, go, all of that is the model. Those are the five primary values. But I do want to share with you underlying that our core values and there's seven of them and the core values are not necessarily spiritual though some of them are spiritual but the core values are more about how you do what you do see if you're looking at that graph that's what we do we worship, we serve, we grow in discipleship, we connect through fellowship, and, and we go in evangelism and in missions. That's what we do. But our seven core values are more about how we do it. And the first one is authenticity. Get real. Authenticity. Get real. Hey, get real with me. Don't you just hate being around people that are fake? Mm -hmm. You know, you can just kind of sense the mask thing, sort of a facade, and, and you no, know, we don't have to be that way. Get real. I appreciate it when people take the time and make the effort to get real with me. There is a story from the scriptures that speaks about um, Paul and his journeys, the Apostle Paul. And Paul went through an amazing ordeal. So it really lines up with our core values beautifully. 
Here, here's what I know about Paul. Let me just take a moment to, to give you this story because I found it so encouraging. You see, Paul was told, you're going to go to Rome. And so Paul, long about 58 A.D., Christ had died and rose from the dead and went back to the Father. And he writes to the church in Rome and says, I long to come and see you. I plan to come and be with you. Rome was west. But Paul was writing from Ephesus. And, and Paul, instead of heading west, you know what he does? God, by His Holy Spirit, leads him east. Headed west by going east. It doesn't make any sense. Paul leaves from Ephesus and he's journeying to Jerusalem to try to make it for Passover. Uh, along the way, two different prophets of God said, if you go there, you're going to fall into harm's way. People begged him, Paul, don't do this. You might get arrested. But Paul said, I'm willing to die even if I have to. All that matters to me is just to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. That is the only thing that's driving me. So he goes to Jerusalem, and precisely like what had been predicted, he got arrested. There were some charges that were trumped up. They construed some false things against him, and, and he finds himself in prison, and through the course of events, he appeals to Caesar rather than to the Jewish council. And he goes to Rome. Not, not the way he planned. He goes as a prisoner. He didn't go as quickly as he planned. It took him five years from the point that he wrote and said, I'm coming to see you in Rome. Five years of travel east to head west. And when he does get there, He's under house arrest and he has opportunity to minister to the Christians in that area and Jews who were being converted to Christ. The amazing thing about it, you know, somebody could look at Paul's life and they could say, well, you know what? He, he said that he'd heard from God and he was going to go to Rome. Well, his prayers aren't very good. God didn't answer his prayer. It took five years for that to happen. Why did that happen? Well, if what we know from history is true, that Paul wrote Romans around AD 58 or so and arrived in Rome approximately AD 63. And in AD 64, a wicked, evil king, the emperor Nero, ascended the throne. And Nero was, was a horrible dictator. And, and he thought that his garden was too dark at night time and so he commanded that Christians be brought in and strapped to stakes and he burned Christians alive in his gardens just to be abused. God knew exactly what the people were going to face under Nero and he sent Paul on this journey experiencing hardship until finally he went west by going east and he arrived at his place of ministry. Part of that journey, part of that five-year journey is that in Acts chapter 27, Paul was in a shipwreck and nearly died. But God blessed him and all of the men who were on board, they safely reached the shore. Just notice how real he is. Verse 10 says, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our lives also. That was before they ever left. He's trying to tell the captain, Captain, let's not go. Don't do it. This is going to be a disaster. He's being real. Look at verse number 20. Uh, Acts chapter 27, the same chapter, but verse number 20 says, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Gave up all hope of being saved. I like that he's real. It was a desperate situation. We value authenticity. Number two, we value originality. And we say it this way, be yourself. Originality, be yourself. So much of current culture feels airbrushed. 
And I just got to say to you, when you come to Buckeye First Assembly, you don't have to put on airs. You don't have to be something that you're not. Just be yourself. Because here's what I know. The God, the, the you that God designed you to be is fantastic. You can do things that nobody else can do. So don't have, you don't have to be a, a copycat, try to be something that you're not. Just be yourself. The third core value is relationship. And we say it this way, risk genuine friendship. Risk genuine friendship. Um, just like Jesus with the woman at the well. Think about that. Jesus comes up to a lady that he's never met. And uh, it would be the equivalent of you and I going down here to r &D Water Supply and going in to just fill the water jug. And while, while we're there getting water, striking a conversation with a lady. And eventually, the entire town gets saved because of his interaction with her. Risk relationship. Risk a genuine relationship. Sometimes you get burned when you risk relationship. There's always a risk. But it's worth the risk. And so I, I say to you, let's build relationship. Number four is integrity. Integrity. Maintain accountability. Maintain accountability. Have somebody in your life to keep you on target. Be the same person on the inside as you are on the outside. Be the same person in public as you are in private. We value integrity. And so, while we are not perfect, we are striving to do everything we do with integrity, with authenticity, with originality, with relation building. And, and these are values for us. Uh, every one of us needs a Paul and a Barnabas and a Timothy in our lives. Paul represents that person who is higher than me, not in a positional sense, not spiritually higher, but I mean to say someone who's been down the road, who's had a little more experience than me, and they, they've been there, they've been where I am, and they can mentor me and pour into my life. And we need a Barnabas. We need somebody to come alongside of us in ministry to partner together. And we need a Timothy, someone that we're a, further, uh, we're a little bit further down the road than them. We can pour in, into their lot. So we, we really value that accountability through integrity. The fifth one is usefulness. Stay sharp. Stay sharp, man. Keep yourself sharp as a tack. Don't let yourself get bogged down in the mud of traditionalism and, and never keep growing and moving forward. One of the most tragic things in the kingdom of God is to see someone who has had faith in Christ for many years, but they are stunted in their growth and not growing in their walk with God. So I challenge all of us, usefulness, that is a, a value. Stay sharp. Use your God-given abilities to empower the kingdom and be honest about your effectiveness. And I, I think as we are all open and honest that way, then the kingdom grows and, and is powerful. And then number six is commitment. Commitment. Show reliability. Show reliability. Church family, hear me. If you say you will do something, do it. Don't leave our leaders hanging. Don't say, yes, sign me up for that ministry, and here's the day that I'll do it. And then the day comes, and then you just sort of forget about it and, and blow it off. And don't call. If you can't do something, then part of that integrity is the integrity to call my leader and say, you know, I can't, and here's the reason why. But... Um, but I found a replacement, and, and here's how that's going to happen. That is so important. Commitment and show that reliability. Um, you know, Paul exemplified all of these things. I haven't put up all the scriptures, but all of these seven points. He was very original. He was himself. He, he built relationship. He built relationship with the captain on this ship. 
And if he had not done that, every one of them, all 276, would have died. I mean, that's the reality. Through that relationship, God rescued him and all the other prisoners and everybody on that ship. Um, usefulness. He was very useful. He, he pointed out things to them that they needed to know. And his commitment was unwavering. Even though he had lost all hope, and everybody had lost all hope, yet he continued seeking God, he continued praying, and, and God sent an angel messenger in the night who stood by him and said, Paul, don't be afraid. You're going to make it safely to shore, and I have graciously given you the lives of everybody on the ship. The seventh one is generosity. Our seventh core value, generosity. Share resources. Share your resources. Um, contribute ideas, finances, and materials that enable ministry and mission. Did you know that the kingdom of God uh, takes money to operate? Amen? Yes. You know what? We, we won't save the world with bake sales and car washes. The way the world gets saved is for people to say, I value this so much and I'm putting my money where my faith is and I'm going to back the vision. And, and money follows vision, not the other way around. And so I, I challenge you to get on board and be, be as generous as you can because you are, you are like we talked about earlier, you are purchasing eternal shares in a company that has eternal benefits. You talk about investment that gives a return. Every time you share, you are reaping a reward for eternity. So I want to just keep the main thing the main thing. And here's the main thing. How do, how do you keep the main thing the main thing? Stay grounded in Christ. So you can soar. I hope you catch the play on words. Stay grounded so you can soar. Stay grounded in Christ so that you can soar on the wings of eagles. That's really the heart of this vision. It, it truly is. And so, um, I want to have you join with me, and we're going to declare it together. We're going to, we're going to declare our church vision statement. I want to ask you to stand on your feet. There are three different screens, uh, three different slides that will come on the screen. It's our declaration. And the way it's going to work, I'm going to read the part that's in white. And you're going to read the part that is in orangish, yellow, orangish brown. I'm not sure what that color is, but that's your color, okay? And when we get to your part, I want all of us to read it out loud and for us to have a sense of ownership over these three weeks of unveiling church vision. Uh, don't forget to be back next Sunday and the following Sunday. All of that will lead us up to a point where we hand you the printed vision statement and you take it with you and you can see the game plan. But we're declaring our faith because we want to find purpose in Christ and share. Here's our declaration. Our world is in such pain and turmoil Almost every family we know has experienced battles of some kind or another. There's not a lot of hope in the world today. But we have experienced hope. And Jesus wants us to share. Buckeye First Assembly, we have a great responsibility. Will we answer the call to minister to the ones who are hurting? Yes, 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 yes. But how? What could you possibly do for people who are hopeless? We will teach them to find purpose.
purpose by what means? By my purpose in my house. If you will do this, it will work. It is God's plan for the lost world. But you must be faithful to do your part. Say it to your neighbor. Say it like you mean it. One more time. I want us to declare it once more. As Pete, would you put that last slide up there? This is the heart of our vision. We want to share. Let's say it together. Find purpose in Christ and share. I want to ask the musicians to come up here. We're going to sing um, one of the worship songs again before we leave. And as we're singing, as we're worshiping, I pray that in your heart you will really just begin to link with God in vision and to really surrender yourself completely and totally to Him. He's our everything. He's our world. He's, he's everything to us.